cool. We're live, boys and girls. Let me make sure this comes up. Just waiting for people to get into the room. Do, do, do. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Hello. Welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer podcast. Uh, you can find us on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And if you're listening to us on iTunes right now, please leave a five-star review. It can say whatever you want, and I will read it. Really quickly, I want everyone to know I'm doing stand-up this Friday, tomorrow, uh, in Bethel, PA. So if you live in the Bethel, PA area... I don't know what's around there. I should have Googled it. But the comedians of the compound will be performing at the Pat Garrett Amphitheater. I know a lot of tickets. It might be close to sold out. I know there's a few left. Um, so check out my website, chrissymayer.com. If you're in the area, you want to come to a really great show. It's myself, Anthony Cumia, Gino Bisconti, Aaron Berg, Don Jameson, and a couple of your other compound media favorites. Quick shout out to our sponsor, Cushy Dreams. Yeah, baby. Maybe I'll light one up. Uh, they are my go-to for CBD products. I found myself really liking CBD, you know, over the last year as we were all full of anxiety. And I like it. Like, yes, it looks, feels, smells just like marijuana, but it's not. You're not going to get high. There's like 0.3% THC in all their products. Like, yes, they have joints, which I love because I don't have to like pack a bowl like I'm a, you know, 25 year old man. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I like these joints because they are chic and I can't open them with one hand, but they're great. Uh, let's, let's pull up their website so you can see what I'm talking about. They have Bud. And they also have joints, but I really like the joints because they're chic and they fit into my purse. Um, here they are right here. Boom. Okay. Cause she dreams. I'm going to the read now. Uh, tastes great. looks just like high quality weed, but it's not, you're not going to get high. There's 0.3% THC in here. You can enjoy all the health benefits of CBD without getting high. Who now it's ASMR. It's cannabis that ships directly to you and it's legal in all 50 states. Join the men and women who are sick of vapes and gummies and want to smoke their CBD. And look how cool I look too. I wonder if I'll get taken off of YouTube for talking about drugs. I think that's what they like to censor me for when they don't know what to censor me for. 100% hand trimmed, never machine trimmed. They do independent lab tests to show compliance and purity, all of which you can find on their website, cushydreams.com. That's cushy with a K. Uh, every batch is slow cured for two to four weeks to guarantee maximum freshness and preserve flavor in cannabinoids. And best of all, it's grown here in the USA. They have different indica sativa blends like energy, hustle, relax, create, dream, peace, um, et cetera. So go to cushydreams.com, K-U-S-H-Y, and get some high-quality CBD bud. At checkout, use promo code CMP. You're going to get 20% off your whole order, and I think free shipping as well. That's why I like it. I like the hustle blend if I'm feeling like I need a little up and at em. Um, And I like the dream blend, like before I go to bed and such. Yeah, check it out. If you struggle with anxiety, it's definitely worth a try. All right, boys and girls, I am so excited to have this gal on the podcast today. Um, I This is the second, uh, I guess, like, the, I've had a, a, a member of her family on this podcast before. I actually had her aunt on, uh, but I'm having her, I'm having, I'm having her on. Um, she, her sort of social media, you know, identity is called Coulter Culture. That's already a that's already a hint right there. Uh, she writes for the national file. Um, she's red pilled and, uh, yes, yes. She's Ann Coulter's niece. All right. All right. I wasn't going to say it, but I'm saying it. <laughs> it's Kim Coulter. Yay. Yay. <laughs> oh Are my you? God. I'm doing great. It's so good to see you. It's so good to meet you. I was about to tag you on Twitter and I was like, Ooh, your girl is banned off Twitter. I like her already. <laughs> Yeah, I've been off Twitter for a minute now. Uh, they they nuked me not too long after they... I, I had a serious shadow banning problem. And then I just... Um, Antifa, California, people started coming after me. And I knew my account wasn't long. So I just started saying whatever the heck I wanted. And um, wow. within like a week, it was gone. And it... 
I, I believe the shadow banning started after you posted a picture from your birthday. You were with Anne and you're with Milo. And yeah. that's where I guess you got on their radar. My, my husband was banned that night. Um, <gasps> Whoa. Yeah. From the time it took to leave dinner and go to the train station, he was banned forever from Twitter. Um, oh my God. Is yeah. he like a red pilled bad boy too? I don't know okay. anything about your husband. <laughs> if you think that I'm like super red pilled, um, like wait till you meet my husband. He is extremely red pilled. He is, uh, he's a, a, I would say he, um, confidently that he is an up and coming politogrammer. A lot of people follow him and he's, um, as they like to say, extremely based and, uh, major Chad. <laughs> major. Ch oh my God. Sounds like the perfect man. Oh, he's fantastic. No wonder you were like, I must immediately reproduce with this person. And you just had a baby. Oh my goodness. <laughs> About two weeks ago, we had our, our first baby girl, Aria. Mm. She's precious and wonderful and being a perfect angel right now. I'm very proud of her. Her name's Aria. So you named her after the Las Vegas hotel she was conceived in. How <laughs> Uh, I prefer people to think of it as the Game of Thrones reference over that. But <laughs> no, that's like, obviously the nerdy instead of the other end of that spectrum. I was just making a lame joke. Yeah, no, that's a beautiful name. And uh, wow, so is this the fir first pod you've been since you've been uh, like without child inside you? Yep, this is the first time that I've done anything really public uh, since uh, January 6th, actually. That was like. Were you there too? Yeah, I, I wasn't in the Capitol, but I was, I was there for the speech. Um, I was doing on the ground reporting for National File and uh, taking video footage for them. So, so you're basically doing the same thing that I was, except like you, you were like with a group. I was just, I went rogue by myself and I was like, I want to talk to the people. Like I want to see, cause I had gone in November and December and I was like, oh, it'll be, it'll be just like the other two. Well, it was very brave of you, I will say. Well, you were there too, right? So, I mean, like, I mean, I, I at least I had a ton of backup. I was also, um, I, I stayed with the Proud Boys the night before the rally. So, um, I had a bunch of them like on, on all of our sides. They went over safety protocols for if anyone were to even try to get in our way. Um, so that was the, you know, for the bad reputation that they get every time I've interacted with them, it's always been in a really wonderful capacity. Anybody. And, yeah. yeah Anyone yeah. who has something bad to say about the Proud Boys has never met one because exactly. if you're just a brainwashed uh, legacy news consumer, of course, that's what you'll think. But I remember, too, they were uh, I think it was January 6th. Like they were all staying at that. They always stay at the same hotel, like over the last few um, rallies I had been to. And then I guess finally on the 6th, like that hotel canceled a lot of their reservations. I can't remember the name, but it's like one of the oldest hotels in the area in DC. Yeah, and I wish I remember the name of the hotel, but I don't. Um, everybody ended up in an Airbnb that night. Yeah, and I, I remember I was hanging, we were still hanging around the hotel and I'm kind of interviewing and talking to the guys and like, like most diverse group of guys, uh, but they all have a few things in common. Like they love this country. They have like, they're like real men. Like they have, they all have this like protector instinct and uh, they want to fight for what's right. And uh, I think which is why the media loves to paint them like with such a, a horrible brush and make them seem like horrible people. And they're kind of just like overgrown Boy Scouts to me. I don't know if that's a fair assessment. Like I one was showing me all his like different like knots that he could tie and like his gear. I don't know. I think they're cool people. But um. So I I want to hear about your journey, Kim. Um, were you born and raised in New York City? Yes. Um, I was adopted when I was just a few days old to the Coulter family. I grew up in New York. Um, I was kind of, I, I refer to myself as a reformed degenerate leftist. Um, <gasps> Girl, grew, same. Yeah, I, you know, New York is a very blue state. And especially when you grow up with the name Coulter, people try to like drive into you really early that you should not be on the right, you should be on the left. And um, that was definitely interesting. Um, I, you know, I was, I, I went to like eight or nine different high schools and. Uh, Whoa, and, and, why did you move around so much? I am. Um, I just, you know, I was very uninterested in uh, standard academics. Um, I would often like find myself kind of just like doing my own thing. Um, and like I said, I, you know, I was somewhat of a degenerate. I started, you know, like the smoking pot and all that stuff, like super young. Um, so that, that definitely led to just like more, um, 
degenerate behavior. I was like, uh, by the time I was 19, I was just like painting murals and doing acid with my friends. Uh, so I- um, So you were just born in the wrong decade, it sounds like. Yeah, basically. <laughs> well, until I decided to get my life together, um, you know, just, a, I think it was like five years ago now, I, um, I was living in a really crazy situation in LA and um, actually one of Anne's friends um, had dinner with me and he was like, well, if you want to come, you know, start over, I have this huge ranch and you can just like bring your dogs and Aww. figure out what you're going to do next. And I was just like, I was all over it. Um, and he started slowly introducing me to Tucker Carlson and it was over. Um, wow. I started hanging out with like Lucian Wintrich and um, I finally met Milo and I realized that all the people who had been saying all these crazy things about um, people on the right were totally lies. Like people like Jack Kosobic and Cassandra Fairbanks, like they're, you know, Cassandra's not necessarily right wing, but um, all these people who had such a bad smell painted on them, it lifted the veil, so to speak. And that's when the red pill journey began. <laughs> and who was Lucian Wintrich? Um, he is actually the youngest um, openly gay White House correspondent in American history. He was oh, wow. from his um uh advertising job to because of his support for trump and he was discovered because he did a series of photos called twinks for trump i and love it <laughs> it's, it's it's wonderful and fantastic and he's a great guy um but yeah int getting introduced to him and spending some time with him in dc getting to know the scene and i decided i wanted to be a political commentator so i started you know gearing myself towards it over the next several years and here we are now i'm working with national file and i've done a lot of reporting i've done an expose on the fbi i um, Ooh. You know, i i've done a, i've done a lot in the field and i wasn't this wasn't even the area of uh, um that i studied in college so what did you study um film editing uh, graphic design and animation. Wow. Oh my God. When I was a little, little girl, I mean, after I was done wanting to be a veterinarian, cause I was like, Oh God, math, science, no thanks. But after that, there was a time that I really wanted to be like an animator and like work for, I don't know, like Disney or Pixar or something. So, and that's funny. And I just had like Ian Crossland on, he was like a theater major. I was a communications major. Like none of us, you were so ahead of your time. Um, when you were in school, when you were younger, and you're like, "Yeah, this is all bullshit." Like, <laughs> I'm better than I'm better than this whole uh, system here. So, right. good for you. You like moved on from it. So you grew up in New in New York. You were bullied into not uh, admiring Anne, which is crazy because I heard in another interview you would run up to people if you saw them reading one of Anne's books, and you'd be like, "That's my aunt or aunt." I never know how to say it. Um, you'd be like, "That's my aunt," you know, and uh, and then you had people basically telling you that your own family like she's evil she's a nazi and which is what i heard about her too and then i met her and i was like oh you're like the one of the nicest people i've ever met the yeah coolest exactly. like makes me want to be smarter like makes me want to be more well-read makes you want to stand up for myself like just very positive influence oh absolutely and i wish i had acknowledged that at a younger age too um I mean, to be a colter, you kind of have to have thicker skin, which I didn't necessarily have until I got a little bit older. Um, but I feel yeah. like I had like followed her influence um, from a lot earlier on. Well, I mean, you know, it uh, could have showed up what I didn't. <laughs> of course. And then and then you would just I feel like if you were to do that, you ultimately have resentment because you have to bang around. You have to make all your own mistakes. You have to like exactly. get fired and lose friends and you have your red pill moments. And then you're like, oh, no, I'm fighting for this within rather than this is what I was told is a good thing to do. And Anne, as <laughs> a message for you, Anne was like, why doesn't she move to Pennsylvania? <laughs> they have excellent gun laws. <laughs> it's much closer than West Virginia. <laughs> oh, that's um that's interesting yeah she was excited that i was having you on um okay so you moved to la you met lucian Win lucian wintrich and uh the the dark figures of the uh intellectual web uh and then you got involved with stop and tell me if this timeline is off then you got very passionate about stop the bias Yes, absolutely. Well, I um, that's around when I was introduced to Laura and and uh, started learning more about her and her kind of journey through um, being an undercover journalist with Project Veritas, and then um, you know it being like this major provocateur. And she started doing crazy stuff like chaining herself to Twitter and um, you know storming the stage of Hamilton and uh, all sorts of other awesome stuff like that. And I just thought to myself, you know. 
Um, these are the kinds of people that I want to surround myself with. This is the kind of stuff I, I want to, that I want people to talk about. I was still kind of in a naive phase where I was like, I can make, I could be the olive branch between the left and the right, because like, I'm going to be the one to break the dichotomy and I'm going to be the one to show them that these aren't bad people. Um, of, of course, immediately, like most of my farther left friends decided I was a white supremacist and a Nazi and that I was just not worth uh, hanging out with anymore. It takes almost nothing. Literally a pair of camouflage shorts at this point is all you need to be a white supremacist. A red hat or, you know, yes. a, anything like that. A, f a flag now is like uh, a partisan, yeah. is a partisan uh, thing. So, yeah. And, <laughs> okay, so Stop the Bias was really about free speech and then you... I know well, that's the reason I wanted to write is to stand up for free speech and for the Second Amendment. So not too long after that, I started a gun group um, called Motivational Armed Gun Owning Americans, formerly known as the Motivated Armed Girls of America. So it's like tongue in cheek MAGA stuff, but um, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And why, um, which is really cool because I haven't talked about this with any of my guests ever, I don't think. Uh, why do you think the Second Amendment is par of particular importance to women? Well, I mean, women, um, I, you know, I, I love to point this out. Like women definitely are different than men. There's a, the biological. What? <laughs> I know it's crazy, but like, I'm here with the scoop. There's major differences. And one of the major differences is, um, our ability to stand up for ourselves on average, an average man who would want to try to overpower us is, um, more likely than not. And um, I, I'm forgetting the specific terminology of the quote, but it's something like uh, God created man and uh, Smith and Wesson made men and women equal. <laughs> oh, that's a t-shirt. Yeah, so it's, it's, that's definitely not the verbatim of the quote, but um, I definitely, that's, that's how I feel when it comes to women in the second amendment. Like I would always um, rather have women trained to be able to handle that situation. And unfortunately, a lot of women don't find that until they've already um, become a survivor of assault, uh, then they realize, you know, they would have rather had a gun to be able to defend themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, when I was uh, also a brainwashed lib way back in the day, I never understood why anybody had guns. I was like anti-gun. I was like, why can't we all just get along? And thank God, like knock on wood, I've never been mugged. I've never been attacked. But like, why wait until that happens for you to be like, oh, I guess I should protect myself because then it's like you might need therapy. You might have some trauma. Like you might be physically very, you know, injured. Um, it's a scary thing. And it's like, yeah, the average dude is uh, bigger than the average chick. And um, like I carry mace around. <laughs> I'm just like, I bet the first time I use it, I'm going to spray myself. But right. It's just good. It's just uh, and and now the more more people I talk to, more people my DMs are like, you see people posting on social media. They're going to the range. Like people are just warming up to it more and more now. It's like it's kind of uh, it's getting to be quite trendy. I think. Ooh, super chat from Matthew Hammond, Chrissy and Kim over Michael Mouse on Timcast. Oh my goodness, what a high praise! That is high praise. Thank Thanks, you, Matthew. I mean, like, come on, you know, uh, and actually. Uh, Kim was on Timcast May of 2019. This was after you were, uh, I guess you were fired in kind of a shitty way. Uh, do you want to, <laughs> do you want to recount uh, yeah, you know, sure. what led to that? Um, actually it's, there's a great retribution story in there. So I definitely will. Um, I was working for a local coffee shop called Willoughby's, um, and they're, they're all over Connecticut. So I'm not really giving myself away here, but um, they, there was, a uh, an instance where a coworker of mine, a younger girl, I honestly, like, I don't blame her because, um, we, we are in Connecticut, the land of Sandy Hook. And, um, I guess it was a sore subject, but somehow Alex Jones came up and she said something about wishing Alex Jones would be killed in the street. And I just, I pointed, I, I just stopped her. I was like, first of all, like, that's absolutely disgusting. Um, then no one deserves to be killed on the street. And so she said it him. in passing, like behind the uh, the cappuccino machine. She just sort yeah, of like exactly. we're just pouring we're pouring hot hot water through beans here, and um, <laughs> one's dying in the street. Aren't we all just pouring <laughs> hot water through beans? And <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I I would say that for the most part, that's a very <laughs> part of each of our days. But uh, so I was um, 
shortly after that. So she uh, said that, and you had already met him at this point. Yeah, or- no, I, mean, I, I, I believe I had either already met him or I'd been on his show at least um, a couple times. And um, oh no, I hadn't been on his show yet. That's right. I had only met him um, in passing, probably at like an event or something. Uh, not even enough for him to like look at me and know my name. That that didn't come till much later, but. Uh, you know, a lot at the time, like most of my friends are active journalists, and I just I made it very clear that that was a very inappropriate comment to make about people. And um, d- the next day, our schedule was posted, and I wasn't on the schedule. And my friend texted wow. me, and I called in, and they said, you know, we're thinking that you're not a good fit here, even though I was a terrific barista. Um, I did my trial by fire at Starbucks, so only needing to know eight drinks was the easiest job ever. Um, it was basically that and just cleaning. So, and they let you, they let me pick up as many hours as I wanted. I was already helping train people. So it was wow. like a nonsense thing. Um, but the rep- retribution, um, the guy was a crappy manager and he was fired not too long after this instance. All right. Yes. <laughs> Karma, baby. Very seldom would I celebrate someone getting fired, but that guy was uh, no good. I only celebrate if you are an ex of mine. Other than that, <laughs> other than that, I wish everyone the best. Right. Um, okay, that's really cool. And then, so after doing Timcast, did you did you see a big rise in your following? Um, in it, your I think it spike, definitely. Um, and that's when I also started like actually being more vocal about pol- political stuff. Um, and that. Um, Actually, Laura Loomer is the one who got me um, connected with the job that I have now. So I'm eternally grateful for that because it definitely, um, you know, who wants to be a barista? I mean, like, it's a it's a cool job and I have nifty uh, skills for making nice coffees. But uh, beyond that, it was time to move on. And this is definitely something I see as a longstanding career. So um, shout out to Willoughby's for firing me. And, yes. Uh. Um, Oh, shout out to Tim Cast and all of them for rallying around me and uh, helping me find a voice in this movement because it's, you know, it's everything that's worth standing up for. It's everything that's worth doing. Um, this is the best country in the world and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And I get to represent real news on subjects that actually matter um, with topics that actually influence real stuff. And that is a major step up from like, you know, the bum in New York or the, the mm. like, medical weed advocate in California or the artist or whatever. This is so much more important. And I feel so much better about like the world that I'm bringing my kids into and, um, while it's fun to like troll the left and uh, be a be a culter with a sharp tongue, it's like very very rewarding to actually be able to do something that matters. Wow, yeah, and everything happens for a reason too. Like I have been fired like at least four times, um, and I and I think it's just like uh, it's like God telling me like, girl, you need to stay, you need to stay out of these regular ass jobs. Like you need to uh, just get over yourself and uh, start a YouTube, I guess, or get back on stage um how did you end up meeting laura loomer um through lucian actually um and i just you know like i said i started coming to more rallies i started doing more um like actively in the scene and networking with people and um she was you know we had we had a lot of the same friends and um you know i consider her a good friend of mine now um i went to go help Uh, well not help but I went to celebrate her primary victory when that happened and then you know we were all very disappointed when she lost um, the election but she's still going at it and you know I feel like she got a lot more votes than people were even anticipating and I feel like she can really uh, get it next time so uh, yeah yeah that's great she's a cool girl to know and she was actually one of the first um, interviews that I ever did I was running a mental health awareness podcast that's kind of how I like started integrating the two um fields and i did like a two hour long interview with laura loomer about oh like, wow her up and coming into the field and like the um the crazy um turbulence that would happen like when she got famous out of nowhere and um just like the actual like behind the scenes of like what that was like for her and it really was awesome to be able to have that conversation with her on a, a very personal level yeah, it seems like it's it's so important. Uh, it feels like there's no path for like whatever this is pursuing truth. Like there's no like you get this degree or you go to this school or you study, you take these classes. It's like it's kind of like 
you you're called to this to be part of this like truth movement whatever it is and uh, you just sort of like you make friendships uh and you you have mentors and uh they can they sort of help steer you it seems it's not like it's not anything uh i feel like my parents would have ever been like oh yeah <laughs> it's just there's no uh because there's no guaranteed like i guess income or career path it's just but right. i'm like just like you i feel like all of my rejections and all of my hardships in life have like really led me to to fighting for free speech in comedy right now because it's like uh, that's when I really became like so politically activated. I was like, oh yeah, this matters because I can't do what I love on stage and neither can any of us. Like if, if there's just so more and more things you can't joke about and uh, we just can't have fun. It's just, it makes me so angry. So, and then you started writing for national file. Was your, was your specialty covering tech censorship or is that something you like came into later? Well, it's, it was what I was most passionate about at the time. And that's kind of how they taught me how to write um, news copy was, you know, like pick the things that I'm really passionate about, which was um, pro-life, uh, which was uh, protecting the first and the second amendment and uh, big tech censorship. So, um, and I also thankfully had good connections with people who were really making um, major moves in um, big tech censorship protection and who were victims of big big tech censorship. Um, so I, you know, my, uh, I've always been good at doing interviews. I, I tend to be really good at getting people to um, talk to me as if they known me for a very long time, basically. So uh, when I started translating that into journalism, it got me in with a lot of really cool people and establishing those connections and being able to tell those stories has been really cool. And, um, it, you know, starting with stuff that I was really passionate about that got me into politics in the first place really made that transition super smooth. And you're like, I'm shadow banned and suspended all over the place. So I am walking the walk. <laughs> exactly. I, you know, I would, you know, I'm still like a lower level, um, person. I'm not, you know, you don't necessarily know who I am unless you're, um, in the political sphere. And then you might've seen my articles or you've seen something that I've reported on. Um, but even now, you know, I had just taken a, a hiatus um, while I was pregnant with my daughter and um, now just getting back into it, starting with this podcast. So uh, we'll see what I do next. I have a few I have a few stories up my sleeve. So Ooh, nothing <laughs> you want to tease. Uh, well, first, uh, I mean, I I'm doing a, a talk about the hospital that I was at. Um, there is some pretty uh, abhorrent practices that they were using and they first of all they I mean I'll I'll drop the um they they gave me a fentanyl drip without my <gasps> what? what so that was when pregnant. you were pregnant yeah when I was in labor um so like they they just um wow there's there like a lot of stuff there so and I can't I'm not necessarily going to sue them but I am going to um put them on uh put them under a magnifying glass for a minute. Um, right. A sternly worded email. You know? <laughs> right. right. Well, I mean, I think people Damn. should be aware that of how hospitals are treating people, especially during the pandemic, uh, especially pregnant women. Um, it's not necessarily as bad as it is in France uh, where women are being forced to labor in masks until they've been <sighs> and thrown up in their own masks. Um, but that's it, horrible. It's, it's a major problem. Um, and I'm also going to be, there's a lot of people, um, I get a lot of like pop-up ads for these, uh, vaccine trials for pregnant women. <gasps> so, like, oh my God. Uh, that's, that's another thing I, that I've been investigating and, um, looking to report into. So good for you. That's such an untapped, I feel like that's such a juicy subject matter. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's disgusting to manipulate these women that way. And most of these programs are offering like cash rewards and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. And I mean, other than that, I'm mostly covering COVID stuff. I have a really good COVID story. Um, <laughs> so that'll be a, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but it's, it's going to be, um, it's going to make public schools look even worse than they already do. Oh, I can't wait. I love it already. Yeah. I mean, that would be very interesting. Like how was it as much as you like can share like yeah you're going to your the uh, your whole pregnancy was i think during covid right so you're going yeah. into your checkups how often and uh yeah i mean what was that like going well, into your checkups during covid was it you know they wouldn't allow um husbands in 
at the appointments, I we had to do like a specialty ultrasound just so that he can see an ultrasound of his of his child, which was outrageous. Um, Could he zoom in or anything? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I, even at, at the first hospital I went to, they wouldn't even allow that. So, um, <laughs> it, wow. I mean, um, they basically they made it like really um, clinical. Like there, it was very impersonal. And that is the reason I wanted to go to a birthing center in the first place. Cause they were a little bit more lax in the hospital. They let me have a doula. Um, and my husband was going to be allowed in the room in the beginning of the pandemic. Well, not the beginning, but when I, around when I got pregnant, um, there was a lot of talk about even husbands not being allowed in the delivery room at hospitals. And I was just not going to have it that, you know, my husband is going to be there when I give birth to our child. That, is a pretty man. Yeah. Um, and you know, especially when, you know, if we're going to get, if you're going to check our temperature and you're going to make pe people other than me wear a mask anyway, mom, um, changed you already. Oh, I'm a lot softer. Um, <laughs> I would say that I I'm already like, uh, monitoring my, my speech a little bit more. Uh, I care a little bit more about being more vulgar. Um, I don't necessarily engage in as many of the back and forth um, conflicts as I used to, especially online. I, I'm kind of more willing to like just let things go, um, which is difficult when you're raised in a family. Like, I mean, if you can imagine someone more hardcore than Anne, uh, that is my dad, 100%. Oh, wow. So I, it's just like the general atmosphere. I'm very, I'm trained to be very combative and I feel like I've definitely taken a step back from that. Um, I mean, oxytocin is one hell of a drug, man. And um, giving birth was crazy and it was a long process and to have all of us happy and healthy and home and um, like to see my dogs interacting with my daughter and to ha watch my husband when he gets to like rock her to sleep. It's like uh, nothing makes you softer. <laughs> Aww. Oh my goodness. All right, we got a super chat. Ooh, it's Matthew again. When will we receive the first Kim Coulter book? Actually, hopefully within the next year or two. Um, I've been working on a book idea for a while. Um, and uh, I, I'll drop the first um, announcement of this other one here. I'm, I'm actually working on a concept for a children's book as well. So stay tuned for that. That'll probably be a little oh. bit sooner. But um, I've been writing a book about the millennial perspective of the millennial generation, um, examining um, basically what, re what went wrong um down to like uh social media and hmm. entertainment and pharmaceutical influence and stuff like that um kind of also like touching base on a few things that like i saw interfere with my own path and like how i had to turn around and uh change that and i'm hoping that a lot of other people who kind of see that will like help pull themselves out of their own tailspins that is such great subject matter. Yeah, because I imagine social media, like it, it really came about and gained popularity as we were coming of age, you know, like our very formative years. And oh, yeah. it just, it's a, it's been a huge distraction above all. I mean, yes, some of us need it for our careers um, to help promote, but like <laughs> overall, what a time waster, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but also, it, I mean, even all the people who, um, other than Mark Zuckerberg, all the people who created Facebook have said that they, they feel responsible for deconstructing the social fabric of society. <laughs> and it, uh, they, you know, they no don't like, deal. <laughs> Just, they don't yeah. kids use Facebook, like the people who make Apple don't let their kids have iPhones. Like they understand how bad it is for us. They understand the, um, the dopamine, excuse me, the dopamine triggers that they have wired into our brains and the social culture that they have pushed onto a, a global scale. And they know they're responsible for it. They know it's evil. And um, we're just sitting here dealing with the the consequences. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then you pair that with like, Oh, well, anything that's going on with you, like, let's get a pill for that instead of like, let's mm -hmm. think about why you're anxious. Let's think about why you can't focus. Right you don't deal with it when you're in your formative years. And then by the time you're an adult, you're essentially useless. Right. Right. And it's like, if you're distracted in the years, you're supposed to be like working on your skills. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe a lot of us are just, sometimes I feel like millennials are just kind of like 
a lot of just big kids and there was a lot of failing to launch, like failing to move out. Like, oh, it's okay. It's socially accepted to just live home endlessly with your parents. Oh, because it's hard and things are different and the boomers had it better. There's always so many excuses. Exactly. Wow. Uh, that's a lot less responsibility taking. A lot less responsibility, right? Because if you're not having kids and you don't like own a home, uh, I mean, it really lowers the stakes on like, yeah, you, you could work, you could not work. Well, also, I mean, a lot of um, a lot of people like are staying in menial jobs. Like, for example, a barista, like these jobs that are meant for high school kids, uh, these unskilled, um, low paying jobs. And now you're seeing all these people like, well, they, these jobs should be higher paying. It's like, no, you should have been preparing to ele elevate yourself in your career goals, um, which is, you know, harsh, but true. Right. And if you say like, well, you should be doing better than wanting to just be a barista. Like if you say that, well, yeah, then, then you're being mean or you don't understand. It's like, yeah, it should be for kids. Um, down syndrome people. I don't know. Like there's just, you, sh that shouldn't be your like, you Oh yeah. On part-time work for, uh, you know, living your life. That was never, it was never meant to be that way. No one was ever like, yeah, you know, like go work at McDonald's and um, support your family. Like it's not necessarily the case. And, you know, places, um, even a lot of these uh, lower paying wage places like offer um, these supposedly great benefits. And it turns out that they're really not. And it's, um, that's kind of like a scam in and of itself. Uh, so I just, you know, I'm, you know, the jobs are where we live in gig economy right now, like freelancing jobs are easier to come by now than ever. You can learn almost any skill on YouTube or through yeah. edX, Udemy, like the classes on there range anywhere from like five to 50 bucks. You know, you don't necessarily need to, uh, people don't, are not putting as much emphasis on the college degree as they used to. Um, if you can demonstrate that you're good at a skill, you can, move yourself up. So it's just a matter of self-motivation, which I feel like is missing in a lot of people. And this, these lockdowns really didn't help with that at all. Why do you think the, the motivation is missing? Well, because I think that like in this generation in particular, like, and in it's kind of permeated into culture in general is people are taught to see themselves as victims. And when you're a victim, you're not held accountable for your uh, accomplishments or lack thereof. And it, it creates a, a loser culture. It creates a culture where people stop trying. It creates um, a culture of excuses. And I see that not just in my generation, but like I said, it, it, it's permeating through culture. Like all of the forever victim mentality is not just a generational thing. It's, it's, it's become almost cultural. It's become like an identity crisis. It's that like, oh, I poor me, I'm this victim. People will never see me as equal. And uh, I, I will never get there. So what's the point in trying? It's just lo loser think. And that is, you know, it's harsh to say it that way, but it's just the truth. And people are allergic to words, which is why people like me and people like Anne get a lot of grief for being hateful people. And it's just, just not the truth. You know, the people who are willing to be the most brutally honest with you are the people that you want in your life. And that um, I feel like it's a very popular thing to steer people away. They, they, the democratic party in particular likes to make people feel like um, they have the right to not be offended. They have the right to um, not be spoken to in any way, you mm -hmm. know, unworthy and they don't have to do anything and the government will take care of you and marry the government. And it's, um, you know, they're walking themselves right into the hands of the real fascists. It's such a distraction. Yeah, they don't have to work hard. Just think about it. Like, are you going to get better looking and better shape by going to the gym and just like walking around and sitting down? Like, no, you have to work hard. And like everybody yeah, in your life who's giving you tough love, anybody who's had a rock bottom or an intervention or like really turn themselves around. No, it's like it takes hard work to better yourself. And uh, yeah, the people giving you tough love. Like sometimes that's what you need to like step it up and uh sorry, like, I'm gonna, my plug came undone. I can still hear you, but I got Oh my god, my plug is always coming undone. I'm surprised it hasn't yet in this episode. It usually like I disappear and then I have to pray <laughs> I have to pray that my guest doesn't um leave. But I think we're doing good. Yep. I think it's good. We can get a little view of of oh, Kim's okay. pad here. <laughs> <laughs> It's cool. We're chilling. Um, 
Okay, okay. What else did I want to talk about? Kim, have you? Do you like sushi? I do. I love it, and I missed it so much when I was pregnant. All oh, right, you can't have it when you're pregnant. So, uh, I just went out to sushi with my boyfriend just before doing this show, and I have a I have a bombshell to drop on everybody. Okay, so the sushi restaurants, and I don't know how long this has been going on for, but they are watering down their soy sauce. Oh boy! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I went and like, and then the, like Frank was the first one to notice. He was like, is this like, this doesn't taste. And look, the color is lighter. Cause we, we haven't gone out for sushi in so long. He's used to, he cooks with like talking about self-made. He taught himself to cook just from watching YouTube videos, but he's used to like throwing, you know, the soy sauce on stuff. And it's, he's used to seeing it so dark. And like, we're in this restaurant. We're like, Oh my God, it looks so light. And so we asked the waiter be like, is this, what kind of soy sauce is this? Like, do you water this down? He's like, uh yeah it's light soy sauce like and then he brings out the uh, like the real stuff and it's again it's like black it's like way way darker and it's just like we're like oh my god they water down the soy sauce because it's expensive to make it go further yeah. and i just feel like this is a bombshell i need to spread this message far and far and wide if you go out to sushi like just check Make sure your soy sauce is not well, watered I mean, down. Across the board at restaurants with the price of everything going up. Thanks, Biden. Thanks, um, Biden. Thanks, Biden. Well, <laughs> you know, no more thanks, Obama. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure he's still in there. I'm I sure. mean, he absolutely is. But now we get to the cha The face of it has changed, even if only slightly. Yeah, it's a weekend at Bernie's for sure. Oh, it's oh, it's a hundred percent weekend at Bernie's. But another another point I always like to bring up when it comes to Biden is. Um, like, how far would you be willing to go for your child? And in this case, this is uh, to cover for uh, crack out old, um, like, ex wife, stupid, um, like, philandering. Oh, Hunter. Oh, my God. Like, like rapist. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> oh, he can do no wrong, Hunter. He's uh, he's a golden boy. Yep. It's wild. Like, enough, at this point, nothing would surprise me uh, to, you know, to read about Hunter. It's so well, I mean, now we're now we're talking about how, you know, he's like dropping N bombs and his messages to us. Oh, okay. yeah. He has a Hennessy rate. <laughs> like he's just one of these <laughs> one of these like white guys who has like three black friends. And then he feels like he can. I don't know. You can Parmesan cheese with them in their spare time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Um, you, you mentioned in a, in a previous interview that you you did lose some friends. Was that? kind of a gradual process or um yes and i mean there was it was very sudden for a lot of them uh and then it was gradual for the rest i there are very few people um who are i mean you know there's a good hand there's a handful of people who are actually my real friends who did not uh waver who have maybe muted me on social media but otherwise <laughs> still huh. friends of mine um i'll and take then, a muting yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's that's fine by me. They don't need to follow my page if it really triggers them that badly. And I like to poke fun at them for that every now and again. But um, they all understand that I didn't just wake up one day and go, you know who I hate? The blacks and the gays and Nazis are awesome and Hitler's awesome. And I just like want national socialism. All the people who are smart enough to not think that, um, <laughs> you know, they, they're the ones who stuck around. But mostly everyone else has... Um, blown a lid in one way or another i had several friends who like had to make a big announcement about it on facebook or something. oh god like, really friends with this white supremacist blah, blah blah like nonsense uh people were giving out my phone number for a while um people were trying to get me fired which is hilarious because my bosses are just as based as i am and they, you know they'd get these messages like kimberly said this offensive thing about george floyd on the internet and they're like <laughs> worry about it you know like, You're like let me know where so i can retweet it yeah right and it's 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 uh you know a lot of people um don't necessarily have that same privilege that i do getting to work for people who aren't going to fire me over that kind of stuff and um i don't you know most of the people that i know who are like undercover uh right wingers um kind of have to like be in the shadows about it because they can't just be like all right well like you want to talk to my boss here's their email have fun you know um, yeah and that's a serious privilege that I, I like to try to not take advantage of. Um, but, you know, in a world where, like, 
everybody's being censored. It's really like people have to be more vocal now than ever. And uh, it's hard in an age where, you know, BLM and Antifa will organize and get you fired or they'll protest your work or they'll harass your family or they'll try to like find things that you did like 20 years ago on social media and they'll, you know, make a big stink about it just to try to paint you with some bad smell. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to start using that phrase, paint you with a bad smell. It's so perfect. And it seems like I do feel so grateful. Like, okay, yeah, this is like part of It's my job to be really out there with my views. But I think unless it is sort of part of your job, I feel like the average person doesn't feel like they can be out there and vocal about their views. If Even if they're even the slightest bit centrist or, or right wing, it right. takes less and less to be considered right wing these days. But as long as you're not like obnoxiously left, it's like, I think a lot of people feel like, well, I really can't follow this person or tweet this out. Cause I, I really truly can't afford to be fired. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, it was funny. Cause like, even when I, um, I, w I came back for a party in New York, um, right before COVID, um, it was like a Christmas party and it was for one of my more like flamboyant friends. And I was a little worried that the guests there were going to be kind of in my face about, you know, what I do for a living. And more of them pulled me aside and said, you know, you're so brave. You know, it wow. was just, like, whoa, like if we were, you know, out in the public square, so to speak, you guys would be right with the people, you know, throwing insults. But here you're like, keep it up. I couldn't do it, but you can. It's like, yeah, okay. isn't that funny? Like how many people privately will be on your side in your DMs, but publicly? Right. I guess it's and just I mean, scary. I only deal with it on a very minimal scale as opposed to like a lot of these other people who like are, you know, like the Laura Loomers and the Miley Yiannopoulos who like, and the Alex Joneses who have to deal with that like on a major scale. And they're like, you know, risking everything, you know, people that, you know, want to like really cause them harm and people who really are obsessed with harassing them. And I, I can't even imagine dealing with that on that level. Is there something kind of exciting about like being friends with people that are so like banned and so like kind of forbidden, you know, uh, is it like, is it like that, or is it more just like, no, I think these people are misunderstood and there's something to be learned from them. They're definitely misunderstood. There's, um, but there's definitely something good about being able to say like, no, I know that person personally, like you're not going to sit here and convince me that they're, you know, this is phobe whatever that you're that you want me to believe um it's just you know it's like i said it was it's good that i have that insider perspective like i was far left and now that i've seen the inside I, like i knew that all of the there there was a veil that was lifted right because when i realized these people weren't evil i realized um oh there's a reason that we're trying to make these people out to be so bad um there's a reason that they don't want people listening to them and that's because they reveal how evil the people who are trying to silence them truly are. And um, being able to have that firsthand experience is really cool. I think, and, and you know, like you, you brought it up before, it's like massively influential and it, it was very inspiring to see, um, you know, my little, this little group that I didn't even really realize existed of like people kind of around my age and a little older who were just like embracing the, the hate and just kind of doing what they knew was right anyway. And I, that just really spoke to me on a personal level. Do you think uh, do you think it's working? Do you see anything to to feel like we're possibly headed uh, on a more correct path now? Well, OK, so I, I'm disappointed with Trump in a lot of ways and I'm disappointed with the Republicans in a lot of ways. Um, I think that we've stepped too far left and I think that we're too accommodating of stuff like gender dysmorphia and all these other things that don't belong on the platform that there's way more important stuff to be discussed. But with the Donald Trump era and with the, even with his campaign, um, there was a major cultural shift in this country that I, unlike I had ever seen before, suddenly people cared about politics. Suddenly people were watching what was happening on the news. Suddenly people knew what the president mm. was saying, even if it was taken out of context. Uh, suddenly people wanted to be politically involved and to be um, outspoken, whether or not it was for stuff that I wanted to hear about or agreed with. And I think that people became more culturally oriented people like, you know, you have Scott Pressler who's going around cleaning up. You have people doing demand free speech rallies. You have 
people who are constantly trying to gain influence in the political spectrum in order to save the nuclear family, in order to protect the lives of unborn children, in order to um, convict pedophiles like Jeffrey Epstein and the likes of his his little crew. Um, and that and that's the fight that matters. And that's if, if they they wouldn't be pushing so hard and wouldn't have to use so much propaganda if what we were doing wasn't working. And it might be slow. Um, and Trump might have let us down in a large amount of ways. And you know, I don't, he's not necessarily even necessarily a Republican to me. Um, you know, he's a, a he was a Democrat from New York um, who gained popularity as a populist and. Um, ran on the Republican ticket, but you know he he's still one of those people that like supported vaccines. He still um, listened to a lot of the wrong people. He promoted a lot of the stuff that didn't really need attention, while he ignored big tech censorship by and large mm. tweets. So, um, but what he did for the actual culture of America and what he did to influence the um, the younger generations, particularly Gen, Gen X, um, it was. Benzie. Gen, yeah, Gen Z. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, Gen Z. Uh, yeah, mom brain moment. But uh, it's okay. um, they, you know, it was it's massive. And I'm seeing a lot more kids like want to like, you know, be like stick to virginity until they're married. Do you see a lot that of kids? Wanna, so based. I mean, come on. When was yeah. When is the last time anybody made that sound cool? Uh, never. And it's weird that Donald Trump was the one to get that because he's a degenerate himself. Um, <laughs> So it's it's just interesting that like he was able to have that cultural influence towards like um you know traditionalism and towards conservatism and actually um like reunite certain communities and I think that like people found this new sense of purpose and found like their their voice in these um in the times of Trump. Uh so I appreciate that a lot and I think that um we do have a chance if we keep with that momentum, but we still have a lot of fat to trim in the, in the party. And what's the fat? Well, <laughs> like I said, I think that like we we're, we're too, we're too embracing of like this, um, the distractions. Yeah. The distractions. And I think the, one of the major ones is the transgender nonsense and the, the LGBT, um, alphabet soup mob, you know, it just, um, there's no room for that on, on a conservative platform. Um, you're, we're talking about equality. I'm sorry. I don't see where there's, there isn't equality. I don't know a country in the world that has fought harder for equality and freedom than America. And the idea that we're like, we're these racists who are bigoted. It's like, no, like, like what are you kept from doing? Yeah. These are, not, these are not problems that we have. These are manufactured problems and elevated um, projection of mental illness. And it has nothing to do with politics and it shouldn't be on our platform. And we shouldn't have had a transgender booth at CPAC. And it, it mm. you know, there's just, um, there's a lot of things like that, that I just feel like are extraneous and are meant to distract us. Um, not to mention, like, like I said, specifically with the transgender thing, um, we're promoting that in front of children, like when mo even post surgery, there's still a 40 to 60% suicide rate. These are people I've, I've never known a trans person who hasn't been through serious trauma. And like it is, by definition, you need to be gender dysmorphic. And if you do not treat the mental problems with that, it doesn't matter how many body augmentations you have. It's just cosmetic. Um, yeah. It's just cosmetic. And you still have the mental problems that made you believe that you were born in the wrong body in the first place. So those things do not belong on the political spectrum. They do not belong in the political conversation. Um, as a Catholic woman myself, I just think it's sinful in general. But even when you remove the, the religion from it, it doesn't belong in politics. And we don't need to offer that a platform because it's nonsense. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I think what's getting ignored is like, perhaps like what kind of abuse or trauma has led up to somebody wanting to explore uh like being transgendered or, or having a you know well, a drastic it's surgery ground. it's it's a breeding ground for pedophilia and child grooming you know like when especially we're, we're talking about transitioning young children we're talking about giving hormone blockers to young yeah, it's children. abusive it's crazy yes it's extremely abusive and the parents who partake are you know essentially enacting Munchausen syndrome on their children and, um, you know, the levels of childhood uh, abuse and sexual assault is really high in a community with very few people. So mm. I just feel like that needs to be addressed first and foremost. 
Yeah, and people like fight like, oh, we can, you know, of course it's topical now because it's Pride Month and and everyone's been commenting on these videos that like whether it's like a, a drag, a person in drag, like doing a video for kids or like the cartoons that we've been seeing, like, oh, the drag parade or the Pride Parade. And it's like you wouldn't show your kids a video being like, it's okay to do porn. Just like you wouldn't, it's like the kids shouldn't even be thinking about their sexuality yet. Like they just let right. them be kids. Like, Sure, if they turn out to be gay, cool, deal with it then. But um, it's, it's just not, it's not something that needs to be addressed when you're a child. And I even I even recently um, exposed uh, this woman who uh, there there was a drag brunch event which children under the age of seven were permitted for free. Um, and it, I mean, this woman outside of the event uh, waved a penis, uh, like a penis, a very realistic dildo in front of a 13 year old child's face. Oof. And sexual gestures towards her, and I, I'm hoping that um, she will be convicted of a felony um, in the state of Ohio. Like, but this is not this is like not even an uncommon thing. And I mean, even you know, we're we're learning in schools. They're teaching like uh, masturbation to like first graders. They're teaching about anal sex, you know. And then you have you know like Teen Vogue, which publishes articles about anal and all this other stuff. And their core demographic is like eight to thirteen year olds. Um, yeah. The idea that like it's a uh, conspiracy theory that all of this is meant to groom children is like it, it's you know you can only believe that if you don't actually look at the evidence. Why would you want? Um, and even there are even drag queens who come out and talk about this. Like drag is not meant for children. Um, this, right. This yeah. culture is not meant. Kids for children. kids have always been able to play dress up. Like no one's ever been against that. So, yeah. Yeah. It's just, um, it's hypersexualized and um, it's a breeding ground for child grooming and pedophilia. So that's where I land on that. And that's, um, I mean, we lost a lot of the based Republicans because of this embracing of hmm. uh, this disgusting uh, trend. And we have another super chat from Matthew. Could Milo be any more based coming out as ex gay? I'm so proud of him. Uh, I'm, that's, I, I thought that was cool. I mean, anybody who's been following Milo for the last 10 years knows that like this has been a long time coming. Um, he has been like playing gay chicken <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> for the last 10 years, you know, saying mm. you know, he understands that it's morally wrong. He, wow. And now that he's uh, actually using his Catholic faith to convert um i think that that's super based and uh could he be any more based i don't know um we'll have to see but he um i mean i remember it, one of the first things he said about it was like if he knew that his open um flamboyancy would have paved way for people like it, lady maga he would have killed himself a long time ago oh. and i was just you know like, can you be more honest than milo yiannopoulos right now <laughs> you know could you he's be very more, he's very, very honest yep I did an episode with Lady Maga. I don't know. I, I kind of like. I understand, like probably your point, like, uh, like the drag doesn't belong at all in the party. But right. I, I was like, all right, this is cute. Like, this is fun. I mean, and, and I don't, I don't think he was. I don't think he's like. I don't think he was for, um, like doing it around kids. I don't think he was pushing that. Well, that's okay. So, like Blair White is another example of one of those people who's like, well, you know, I'm. Like, they try to say that they're conservative, even though, like, there's nothing conservative about being gay or tranny or whatever. Um, but even beyond that, you know, um, it's nice that they have these beliefs, um, but that's a normal thing to think. I'm not going to, like, give these people brownie points for believing things that are uh, standard and normal. Like, you, you know, <laughs> I just... And, I think that, um, you know, Lauren Witzke said it, said it right. Um, she did a, a debate with Blair and John Doyle and another person, um, I believe Dr. Carlin. Um, and Lauren p p plainly said, Blair, if you want to do right by the people who follow you, you'll grow your mustache out and you'll start calling yourself by your other name again because promoting mental illness to children. Um, you want to talk about how you think it doesn't belong in, um, in, in modern culture, but then you're still going to like get up and twerk in front of people. You're still going to like be sexually provocative and then talk about how you're actually a conservative. It's, you know, it's complete nonsense. Um, like, 
having conservative beliefs doesn't automatically make you a conservative and still acting like a degenerate while playing the like LARPing the role of conservative because it's pop culture and it's cool now doesn't mean doesn't make you like special it doesn't make you like oh like you, you're against childhood transitions that's fantastic that's normal I'm not going to give mm. Blair White or Lady Maga bonus points for thinking things that are rational <laughs> normal things to think um and I just don't think that that kind of degeneracy belongs on a more grand platform. I'm not saying that these people need to be deplatformed. Like for all, for all, like for all I care, like go ahead. But like, there are just certain places where that stuff doesn't belong. And I think that like adopting so much of the left's uh, mantra is like really sullying the party. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying these people, like I said, I'm not saying these people cannot be a part of our party. I'm not saying these people cannot have political beliefs in our party, but like stop promoting the LGBT shit. Stop promoting the mm -hmm. transgender stuff. Like uh, you, you acknowledge that it's unhealthy and unsafe for children, but what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. I definitely see your point. I wonder if like their purpose is, I think, because then you have like Brandon Strack who created Walk Away and he's a gay guy and you have uh, other like influential folks in the Scott movement Pressler, who like, and then Scott know. Pressler too and then you have okay yeah maybe like um like Blair White okay right like not fully walking the walk so to speak but I feel like these folks are are useful in helping maybe they maybe they will reach more of a brainwashed lib than like you or i would you know like maybe their purpose is to like make somebody think oh well i this person is kind of like me right like they can walk away from the party they can start to um you know splinter off absolutely but don't bring the toxic parts of your old party into this like we we acknowledge as uh, right wingers by, by and large and as conservatives that we all have equal rights and we're all starting from the same basic platform. So like, I don't want to hear extra about like what you do in your bedroom. I don't want to hear about any of that stuff. It's really irrelevant. I have plenty. I like, I hate, I hate being the person that's like, I have lots of gay friends. Oh, but I have a lot of gay of friends. Course, yeah. I mean like, you know, in my religion, it says it's a sin and I, but I still respect them as people. It's not, it's not like I, um, you know, I don't condone a lot of the behavior, but I still I, I admire and respect them and have kinship with people who, you know, don't necessarily live the lifestyle that I would want for them. And that's totally fine. But like I said, it's a matter of bringing that, those issues into the political sphere, like bringing those issues onto the platform that are just really, they're non-issues beyond mental illness or degeneration. And, you know, most of the gay people that I know are not about pride. They hate the LGBT community. Mm. They're the first to like it when I post religious stuff that's anti-gay. And wow. it's, um, you know, they understand fundamentally that it's not about, it's, it's about the lifestyle that you promote more than anything else. So I just, like I said, that's why I think that like the Blair Whites and the Lady Magas are doing a disservice to the party. Like it's, you know, put on a dress in your own time. Do you really mm. need to be MAGA to promote to promote MAGA? Do you really need to, you know, take on this ridiculous costume in order to be right wing? No, like that's not inherently right wing. It's not inherently conservative. And you're just um, LARPing because it's pop culture and cool. Yeah, I, I feel you because you're like, well, look what happens to our society when you don't hold certain values, you know, with, imp with, with importance. Pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, well, why, why is a nuclear family in shambles? Like, why? Uh, There's a divorce rate. Yeah. So high. Why are kids like getting, or, or why are more and more kids um, dependent on pharmaceutical drugs? Because anxiety is supposedly through the roof. You know, it's, we're creating a culture of broken and psycho children. And now we're making them wear masks and um, uh, really yeah. fearful of what that's going to do to kids down the line. Yeah. And it's almost like, yeah, having a kid is like, it's like Jack Posobiec says, like, yeah, like, uh, be a badass, start a family or something. I'm misquoting him, but, um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's be a rebel, start a family, uh, or be a rebel, get married, raise, ch uh, have children, raise them, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, raise them yourself. What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who right. Who has time for that? No, it's, <laughs> it's cool though. Uh, it's definitely, I, I, I appreciate like you in the world. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's always cool to meet somebody who's like, who really uh like believes strongly in something because i just feel like most people are just like yeah whatever why what's wrong with it why can't everybody you know 
Um, and you're not saying like, don't be who you are, but it's, yeah, yeah I, I feel you on that. Yeah. It's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to ever hate on somebody. Like I've had my, like, I've gone through my own stuff. I've done my own bad stuff. I've like, I'm a sinner in my own right. So I am not, it's not up to me to judge. It's up to God to judge. So like, I'm going to leave that up to God and I'm going to live my life. But in the meantime, like when it comes to things that actually matter, when it comes to politics, I don't want to talk about the LGBT ag agenda. I don't, but if we are going to talk about it, we could talk about like the disgustingly high rate of pedophilia. We could talk about mm. drug use. We could talk about um, the culture. And that's what I'm interested in. If, if we want to analyze anything, it's the cultural influence. And if, if we're being honest, we're not seeing a positive cultural influence. We've gone from, oh, love is love. And we just want to like have love to like age is only a number. Ugh, yeah, well, that's like, horrible. And that only took five years. Yeah, this is an interesting comment from the chat. Uh, the media constantly misrepresents conservative positions. So how can there be an honest debate leading to a non-manufactured consensus? Ooh. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that there's going to be more, more of a push for right wing representation. Um, I was hopeful that Trump would start like some kind of news platform that can become more mainstream with all that extra money he's got laying around. Yeah, I thought so too. I thought we uh, we're all kind of waiting for something, you know, and then we're like a website. What? That's it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, hopefully there's more to come, but um, the fact is, you know, big tech runs uh, the news narrative, big tech, um, and the mainstream news are kind of bed are kind of strange bedfellows and they funnel into each other and they create algorithms to work with each other. So you're not going to find the stuff that, you know, people like me, write. The stuff that, you know, people like, you know, the reporting that Jack Kosovic does, you're not going to see, um, you know, Cassandra Fairbanks on the front lines, even though she's been on the front lines for easily the last decade, you know, wow. there's just, um, when you're suppressed, like, you know, Laura Loomer, Alex Jones, all of them warned us very early on that, like, if this can happen to us, it'll happen to you. And it started happening to us. Mm -hmm. And then it started happening to left wing. And it started to, like, become more and more pervasive. And now, um, you know, thanks to Project Veritas, we have endless exposés on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, like, all these people who are, and, like, you know, CNN, the major three letter uh, news agencies who are trying to um, paint them with that bad smell and trying to make it look like there's no way that all of these people are in cahoots with each other when that is how they exist. Um, they, they create a chain of misinformation between each other. Yeah. Oh, Veritas is, is really making a dent. I think uh, for me, it was like, Trump planting the seed of like the media is the enemy of the people. Fake news, fake news. You hear it so much. You're like, what, what is there something to this? Oh my God, there is. And then Veritas going like, boom, here's someone from CNN. Boom. Here's someone from Facebook. Yep. Um, everything you've heard is true. And here's the person saying it. So, well, they say the difference between the truth and a the conspiracy theory is six to 12 months. And I think that uh, Veritas ooh. is expediting that process. Yeah, yeah, thank God for them. That they're 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 tough as nails over there. Oh yeah. Um Jake is a is a hero. He is. He's a G. He's a, he's a superhero. Um yeah, Kim, where can people find you and follow you and um yeah, I guess be on the lookout for this book. Well, okay, so I am just now getting back into the swing of things. I just wrote a bunch of outlines for articles today. Follow me on the national file, just nationalfile.com. You can subscribe. We have a lot of amazing writers for the national file. So please do follow us there. Um, across the board, my handle is Coulter Culture. I'm going to be m rotating towards being more on alt tech. So I'll be on Gab and Parler and Telegram a lot more. But you can still find me on Instagram. I'm banned on Twitter, so don't even try. Um, but that's at Coulter Culture. Um, my chat on Telegram is Coulter Cultured. You can find me also on BitChute. Um, and I run with my husband, we're going to start doing our, um, semi-weekly, uh, news reporting at not neutral news. You can find that on Instagram Ooh. and D live as well. And through all of those things, you can, Oh, you can subscribe to my Substar. Um, I do a weekly newsletter on that as well. Again, that's just Coulter culture. All of that's available on a link tree in my, um, Instagram. And that's where you'll find the announcements for my books. That's where you'll find the announcements for my articles. And hopefully soon I'll get that swipe up feature. I'm, I'm this close, but Instagram always knocks me down. Just oh my God. I was there girl. And then they deleted my whole, my whole shit. So <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll rebuild. I, 
Yep, you will. Yeah. I get it. Aw, Kim, and congrats on the baby. Oh my God, you'll have to send me a picture later. Um, so proud of everything you're doing. So great to chat. Thank you so much for coming on the pod. Thank you, chat, for your questions and super chats. Talk to you again soon, Kim. Good night. Bye.